Uh, okay, if, um, if people are still online at home, feel free to participate in this. So this is a quiz called Science or Fiction, where the panel compete against each other and against me. Um, the, the idea is stolen from the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast. And what happens is that there will be a round, there'll be two rounds, okay? And each round, I'm going to present three medical facts or pieces of news, which are conclusions from articles in the literature relevant to our practice. And one of those three is fake. So two are true and one is fake. So two are science and one is fiction. And it's up to the panel of experts to dis decide which one they think is the fiction and to give their reasoning as well. So um, if you're doing this at home, the deal is don't Google it, all right? A Google will instantly provide the answer on this. So uh, it's just some fun to see if you can figure out which ones are likely to be the fiction out of the three. So um, three articles, two real, one fake, which one is the fiction? And uh, round one is all about RSI. Okay, so I'm gonna present the first one. He decided it's science or fiction. And this is in a study of over 2000 trauma patients comparing atomidate ketamine and propofol for RSI and the ED, there was no significant difference in mean post-intubation systolic blood pressure or mean change in blood pressure between ketamine and atomidate, but propofol led to significantly more intubation hypotension and was associated with a trend towards increased mortality, all right? So there's a study in 2,000 trauma patients looking at RSI and the ED for trauma RSI they looked at three induction agents, and they found that the atomidate and ketamine were pretty much the same, but you got more hypotension when you gave propofol, and also the propofol group had a higher mortality. So we'll start um, with uh, Jess, I think, if that's okay. So you tell me what you think about this one and why. Sure. Um so, I mean, this all seems quite reasonable to me. Um, what we know about ketamine and atomidate as they are used as induction agents for patients with hemodynamic instability because they do have a good profile in that sense. Um, so it makes sense to me that ketamine and atomidate would be reasonably equal in terms of um, systolic blood pressure post-induction. But obviously we know that propofol causes more post it tends to cause hypotension post-intubation, so that seems reasonable. The trend towards increased mortality, um, I haven't heard that in this context, but it would make sense that if you have higher rates of post-intubation hypotension, there'd be a trend towards increased mortality considering the setting that we're doing these RSIs for, so patients with head injuries, you know, preserving blood pressure is important um, and so is associated with um, their outcomes. So to me, this seems like a, seems like it would be real. Yep. Okay, great. So you think science. science. I'll I'm give you a chance science. to change your mind um, and we'll give other people a chance to comment as well. But I'm going to present the second one now. Uh, so here's another RSI study. In a study of over 7,000 RSI patients from an air medical service with an overall first pass success rate of 91%, the use of ketamine was associated with a higher incidence of both hypotension and arrest and lower first pass success rates compared with other agents even after they adjusted for co-variables that reflected patient acuity, okay? So they compared the three, sorry, they compared um, a number of induction agents, there are actually several, and they found that ketamine was associated with worse outcomes, hypotension and arrest, more than the others. Um, and even when they corrected for like um, severity of underlying illness, whether they were shocked and so on, those co-variables. So that's number two. Um, and what I'm going to do is present number three, and then we'll go around the panel. Sorry, I, I've changed the way I was going to do it slightly. So um, have a little think about that one, including people who have dialed in. And I'm going to present the third one now, which is in a randomized controlled trial comparing atomidate with ketamine for RSI in over 700 critically ill patients, the primary endpoint of survival at day seven was lower in the atomidate group. So this was a randomized controlled trial comparing Atomidate, which we don't have in Australia, 
and ketamine. A good number of patients, over 700. Um, and their primary endpoint was survival at seven days. And this survival was lower in the automidate group. So more people died, statistically significantly more people died in the automidate group compared with the ketamine group. So important results worldwide, but not really applicable here, but something we should know about if this is indeed true. Okay, so those are the three things. And um, I'm gonna ask Jess mm -hmm. to pass the microphone down to Claire. And Claire, thanks Jess. Do you mind talking through these three? You don't have to do it in a huge amount of detail. Just tell us uh, maybe a comment on the first, comment on the second, comment on the third, and then tell me which one you think is the fiction. Yeah, so I guess I sit a little bit with Jess about that first um, study, the 2,000 trauma patients. Um, however, there is a little bit of me that wonders why you've put trauma in capitals, so I'm a little cynical <laughs> in that respect. <laughs> <laughs> is it really in trauma patients or is it in all patients? Um, so I guess that's my first question to you, Cliff. Is, it, is there capitals there for some particular reason? Is it an acronym I don't know about? Uh, yeah, so um, the reason was it, it was so long, I thought it was easy to lose the fact that we were specifically looking at trauma because um, the study was a trauma study and I didn't want people to forget that when they're interpreting the likelihood that these results are true or, or made up. Yeah, okay. Well, if, 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 that, if that is the case and it's not some new acronym or a fake thing for there, um, I'm agreeing that I think that is probably quite likely to be true because we do know propofol causes hypotension and in the trauma patients, um, being mindful that a large proportion of them will be head injured patients, we know that the literature is such that um, hypotension will increase mortality and head injury. So I think I'm going to go with the likelihood that that is true. Um, if I go down to the last one, I'm just, you know, again, there's a little bit of cynicism in me that wonders why the next bit is in grey. I think that's just the um, table that you chose. Um, but going to the last <laughs> one, comparing atominate and ketamine, well, as you say, we don't have atominate here. Um, so that certainly is something that kind of sticks in my mind that as I go through the literature, I may ignore this a little bit. Um, but I do you think I remember reading something that there, um, and hearing, I think on MRAP, they did something on this recently, which is that the mortality is greater in the automatic group than the ketamine group. So I think this one is also probably true. Um, uh, again, the facts of the study, is this completely true that it's 700 critically ill patients or otherwise? So, yeah, I guess I'm going to go with this is probably true. Um, but in Australian context, I don't really care because we don't have a tonate. So our patients are going to definitely die and have higher risk of complications if we choose a tonate, um rather than ketamine. So I'm going to go with if we can use with, with study might be true. Uh, and in this next study, I... Yes, I am going to say this one's probably the fake one, although I feel like maybe it's something that I'm supposed to know about and you put it in there for good reason. Um, and in my head, this is a KSS paper, um, that the ones that have recently spoken about this. And for my brain, I'm recalling this is actually not ketamine, but about fentanyl use is what my brain is thinking in that three, two, one kind of component. So that's the one I'm going to say is likely to be fake. So um, you think that the middle one, yes, the, faith. the 7,000 one, is the fiction? Yeah. And uh, Ruby's commenting that she's a bit sceptical about that as well. Mm. Thanks, Rubes. Thanks, Ruby. Uh, so number two is the fiction for Claire. Uh, Rob, do you mind going next, please? Stolen it from Carl. Oh, goodness. <clears throat> um. <clears throat> we'll go Rob, then Phil, then Carl, then <laughs> back to Jess to finish off. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Cliff, we can ask you some more questions about these studies, though, is that right? Or? Uh, yeah, you can ask, and I might give you some more information, or I might Maybe. not. Maybe. Okay. I'm, I'm curious about number two. Mm. Um, we'll come back to one and three, but your 7,000 RSIs is a lot for mm. a service, um, so with a 91% success rate, so, yeah, sort of some fairly active service. I'm wondering what uh, continent or country that the studies come from. Uh, yes, yeah, so this was uh, North America, and um, it was a large flight nurse and critical care paramedic program that involved a number of helicopter bases, and they share a common database, and they analyze that database. Interesting. 
Um, you notice the maintained eye contact and the non yeah, yeah, it was yeah. very, it was, it was almost rehearsed, actually. <laughs> Wondering where that was going to come from. Um, so I'm still skeptical, <laughs> but interesting. Um, 7,000 RSIs is a lot to have on the database, yeah. so especially out of North America. Yeah. Um, <coughs> equally, three, uh, yeah, we, we don't have a Tom and Dave. I haven't had a, a lot of um, interest or reading around that of recent times. Um, seems feasible, however. Um, the one that I worry about a little bit, or the thing that worries me about one, uh, although I definitely agree with a lot of comments that Jess made initially, um, the trend towards increased mortality may be stretching it a little bit. Um, so they're the things that are sort of pushing me to be a, a bit concerned about that. However, um, it's probably still a, a reasonably feasible thing. So I, I'm going to stick with number two as the fakie. Oh, so you're agreeing with Claire? Okay, so Rob's adopting a GWC uh, tactic. We go with Claire. Okay, lovely. Thanks, Rob. Yes. Uh, well, sure. Thanks for having me. <laughs> We're very lucky today to be the only paramedic in the room. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I have very little skills in the area of Atomidate, so I'm just going to write off number three as I can't really have an opinion. In terms of bullshit, though, I can detect. <laughs> and just the other agents is a little bit vague in point number two and yeah I'm going to call that one the bullshit one and the one from above I was doing this before we were giving ketamine for all of our patients and we have just the uh, the bounce in uh, hypo the bounce in blood pressure uh, with, uh, with the propofol we just don't see that with the ketamine so I'm going to say number one's true Number two is bullshit. Number three is potentially true. Lovely. Thanks, Phil. So we've got a, a third GWC. This could be a clean sweep, couldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, Carl. I mean, my money's always with GWC. <laughs> um, I think I not much to add. In that I agree entirely. The first one seemed very reasonable and totally expected to see hypotension after propofol. In fact, it has been described as a drug with significant antihypertensive effects and only slight anaesthetic effects. Um, <laughs> in a, the second one, I, I, I would have thought that if ketamine had been slighted in the published literature so severely that I would have heard about that. Um, there would be a rant, ranting on Twitter, etc. And I haven't heard the, the ranting. Maybe it was just in a little published paper that we haven't read yet. Or, but it seems unlikely. It sounds like it would be some other drug. Um, and then Atomidate and Ketamine, I expect to have very uh, little effect acutely, but there have been some suggestions of adrenal suppression and potential concerns about Atomidate in sepsis, which is one of the reasons why it hasn't been approved in Australia and it's got a losing interest around the world. So I'm going with the... I, I actually wanted to add one last... There's actually one last nail in the coffin for number two being the fakie, <laughs> is if it is... Actually, in North America, a first-pass success rate of 91% is completely bullshit. <laughs> okay. Hmm? All right. So my uh, my my skills at making yeah, shit up need to improve. Do they? Okay. I need to be more plausible. Um, all right, Jess. Anything to add on any of the others? No, nothing to add. I was going to make the same comment about the the atomidate like digging back into my primary exam knowledge being that the big issue with it being that it can cause adrenal suppression so that tended to be if it was given for a few doses but i think it'd be feasible in a critically ill patient so, i mean i guess that seems reasonable number three so i think number two is the fake right thanks team so that's everybody is uh, is unanimous unbelievable right um I thought, might, I'll be right. I thought there might be a bit more disagreement. <laughs> so if you're right, you've beaten me, okay? If I'm right, it's a clean sweep. I've all beaten right. all of you. Uh, so um, 
only, the only person on WhatsApp was Ruby, who's equally cynical, she says, about uh, about the middle one. Let's go through them. Um, I might start with the bottom one, just because uh, that's the quickest and easiest to get through. So in an RCT, comparing atomic with ketamine for RSI in over 700 quickly patients, the primary endpoint is survival at stage 7 was lower in the atomic date group. Um, and... Um, uh, yeah, just to let, oh yeah, okay, so, sorry, I'm just interrupting because uh, Natalie May uh, has GWC'd as well, and Garth thinks this one is the fiction, so let's have a little look. Um, so this was a randomized control trial published uh, in January 2022 in Intensive Care Medicine, so a big high-impact journal, uh, it was a well-done study, it was a true um, a randomized control trial, it was unblinded. Um, but the uh, people who analysed the data were blinded to what was given. And this was the USA. It was a, a, an anaesthetic-based hospital airway team. So they went and did all the intubations around the hospital, um, uh, including the critical care intubations in ED and ICU. And there was a, an attending um, anaesthetist, a consultant anaesthetist present in 99% of the um, cases. Uh, interestingly, their first pass success was 91%. And uh, so, and they had a, a, a an envelope-based randomization system. So they get there, they open an envelope, and I say atomidate or or ketamine, truly randomized. So that was good. And then there were there were dose ranges that were recommended, but they were allowed to deviate from that. So if the patient seemed definitely unstable, they could lower the dose. And um, what they uh, the results? So day seven survival in the atomidate group, seventy-seven percent. And in the ketamine group was 85%, and this just reached statistical significance. And that was their primary endpoint, day seven survival. So um, there was a higher mortality in atomidate compared with ketamine at seven days. Um, uh, however, the day 28 survival was not statistically significantly different. And it's unclear as to why those survival curves merge at day 28. So obviously, if you're not getting out of hospital, you're dead within a month. Uh, it didn't, if that's important to you, which it should be, it doesn't, didn't really matter what you gave. But the study was designed to look at day seven survival, and in that respect, there's a pos positive study um, making this one number three, science, okay, which you all agreed. So let's take the next one. So this was the, uh, yeah, the, the 7,000 RSI patients in a US, in a North American study where they got 91% first pass success. Uh, we all smelt a rat with that one. Um, and the use of ketamine was associated with higher instances of both hypertension and arrest, which is not our experience, um, certainly not consistent with what we teach. And and why would you get lower first pass success rates anyway if you weren't, you know, if you're not giving a muscle relaxant, maybe, but uh, and even adjusted for sort of baseline risk and so on. Now this one is um, this was a true study that was published. Um, and it was a North American service, and they did have multiple bases. They do share a database, okay? And they did have a first-pass success rate of 91% with a non-physician critical care team. And they do both pre-hospital RSI and inter-hospital retrieval. So clearly it's a well-governed or governanced um, organization. And um, they had... Um, if you look at this table of results, which are percentages, desaturation of atomidate, 3.9, ketamine, 6.2, fentanyl, 2.8, midazolam, 3.1. So hypotension, 0.5, 1.8, 0 0.6, and 0 0.4, and arrest, 0 0.3, 1.3, and 0 0.4, and 0 0.3. So these were all higher with ketamine than with the other agents, okay? Um, we're making this one science. Mm -hmm. However, all right. Those, yeah. Go back to the slide. Yeah. So they're not mutually exclusive. Good. So we're, we'll appraise it now. Yeah. So there's a number of weaknesses with this paper, as you'd expect. So it's a, it's a database-derived study. So it's not a prospective uh, controlled trial, and therefore it's inevitably got some bias. Now, remember, they said that they would adjust for co-variables. So one of the things in the database is whether or not the patient was shocked. So they included that.
but their database does not capture vital signs. So they may have had a trauma patient with a systolic blood pressure of 105, who's an 80 year old, and they didn't tick shocked, all right? Um, now, during that study period, they were telling everyone as part of their training and governance program, hey, look, ketamine is something you should be using for your unstable patients. This is the best agent we think. So they actually present a graph of the use of those four agents, and they show that ketamine use goes up and up and up, and they were trained to use it in the sicker patients. So there is inevitably some selection bias that ketamine was used uh, more frequently in the sicker patients, and despite their, uh, their adjustment for co-variables, that, would, that wouldn't have been good enough, uh, I think, to overcome that selection bias. The first part success rate uh, was, it was associated with a slightly lower, but it was not really that significant. I think that's just a ran randomness, to be honest. Um, so I, th I think we've just selected sicker patients who are more likely to become hypotensive and more likely to die. Also, they didn't mention the dose ranges. So may have, yeah, they could easily have been giving two milligrams per kilo of ketamine to hypotensive patients, all right? So like Carl, I'm equally gobsmacked that this wasn't all over Twitter, um, you know, by the ketamine haters saying, see, I hate ketamine. But people who hate ketamine are not on Twitter. Everyone who's on Twitter loves ketamine, all right? Which is why nobody mentioned it. Oh, that's what I think is going on. So I think there's also selection bias uh, on, uh, on what goes on Twitter. All right. Uh, meaning, right, in a study of over 2,000 trauma patients comparing these three. Uh, oh, sorry, just a final thing to say about this one, as Jeff pointed out. There could have been crossover, all right? They compared the main induction agent, but they often gave two. They often gave fentanyl with the ketamine. And that, that wasn't then recorded as fentanyl, it was recorded as ketamine, all right? They're giving a big whack of fentanyl, they're going to become hypotensive right. with the ketamine. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, this one is the fiction. Um, so I didn't make up this study. I just changed the results. All right. So this is a multi-center investigation of the hemodynamic effects of induction agents for trauma RSI done in Texas over multiple trauma centers. Um, and the hemodynamics during RSI, uh, the baseline systolic blood pressure, these are mean levels plus standard deviations. So you can see ketamine, they were more hypotensive in that group um, to start with, which was actually significant. So there were some selected patients, more sicker ones in the ketamine group, and post RSI, fairly similar blood pressures, right? Fairly normal mean blood pressures. This doesn't tell you what the best and the worst patients were. Um, and the change overall of systolic blood pressure during RSI was positive in ketamine and negative in propofol, which you would expect it could go either way. Um, and they remarked that propofol was associated with more discharges home, so these are percentages of total, um, and that was just bordered on significance and lower mortality, significantly lower mortality in the propofol group compared with the other two, which were not statistically significantly different from each other. If you actually look at numbers, um, there were way more patients giving, being given Atomidate. So you've got far fewer ketamine and propofol patients to make a reasonable comparison with. Just got to bear that in mind. You know, was this powered to show big enough differences? So their data suggest better outcomes with propofol, but again, there's almost certainly selection bias here. So they started with the hypothesis that ketamine would have less hypotension, um, and they've disproven that hypothesis. Um, and essentially they've said, look, if you give it in the right dose, propofol is okay, uh, which we sort of knew. Yeah, if you're giving someone a small dose of propofol and a massive dose of ketamine to trauma patients, then you're going to see a better outcome with propofol. Um, so again, it's amazing that this one's not being shouted from the rooftops by the ketamine haters. But it has all of the hallmarks of a of the weaknesses of a retrospective database study. Um, so we'll go to um, pre drawn <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's an insulin syringe. <laughs> syringe yeah. uh, okay, so that's the end of round got us. one. You got us. And uh, that's a clean sweep <laughs> to Cliff. So here's your chance oh. for revenge. Now you know how my mind works and how the quiz works. No other comments from the people dialing in. All right, ready. So this is on emergency medical systems. This is the provision of pre-hospital care. 
more widely. So, paper number one. In a study of over 14,000 trauma patients who were hypotensive at scene, those treated by a physician-staffed ambulance compared with regular EMS had significantly longer scene times and significantly higher mortality, even adjusted for baseline characteristics, including injury severity. Okay? So if you send physicians to the sickest ones, they're probably more likely going to die, but they corrected for that in their analysis with things like injury severity score and so on. Okay. Second one. Patients attended by ambulances capable of providing CT scanning and thrombolysis, so a so-called uh, mobile stroke unit, they had significantly less disability at 90 days in an American prospective multicenter controlled trial of over 1,500 patients. So just like the thing they do in Germany, you've got the stroke ambulances in America, and they made stroke patients less disabled. So it's really good to do a CT scan and thrombolyze a stroke patient pre-hospital. And the third one, in a data set of over 28,000 combat casualties, the use of pre-hospital vasopressors was associated with improved survival after multivariable logistic regression that utilized patient category, mechanism of injury, composite injury severity score, total blood products transfused, pre-hospital heart rate, and pre-hospital systolic pressure. So a lot of these military casualties did get quite advanced medical interventions. And uh, if the pre-hospital providers um, gave them vasopressors on top of all the other resuscitation, they were more likely to survive once you corrected for all the underlying injury severity. Okay. Carl, do you want to go first? Okay, there's lots of questions. Um, <laughs> the first one, uh, can you tell me which, um, which uh, country it's from? Uh, yeah, this was from Japan, and mm -hmm. um, the physicians, or the physician-staffed ambulances, were able to provide pretty much everything we can, from blood products, including plasma, to, um, to pre-hospital resuscitative thoracotomy. So these weren't like, you know, yeah. Swiss residents in emergency medicine anesthesia. These were experienced pre-hospital doctors with a range of surgical skills as well as uh, blood products. I've seen some very strange things on Dr. Heli. Have you ever seen Dr. Heli? It's, oh, yeah. a, it's a, a Japanese uh, sort of hymns, uh, like actual see the parents sort of documentary. And it's the things they do, the Japanese doctors do pre-hospital, are just incredible. Like, anyway. Um, <laughs> I, I got that this could be the way because there are definitely studies showing that physicians attending hypertensive patients have longer scene times because we do more things and that makes sense. Um, but there are some studies showing improved survival and there are some studies showing worsening survival because it is actually very hard to adjust for baseline characteristics. Um, and it's pretty much um, impossible. And you end up just with this bias based on the, the tasking. So that could definitely be true, particularly with Japanese where... You know, it's not a very comprehensive system of trauma care. Um, it, it's kind of an unusual system. Second one, patients in a biomass capable of running CT scanning with thrombolysis had significantly less disability. Um, well, there have been multiple of these CT studies done, every one of them attempting to prove that the millions of dollars they spent on the stroke ambulance is finally worth it. And I believe there has been one that has been successful. Um, showing very slightly less disability. Not only if they do ordinal differences and not overall differences, um, and you have to rule the other 10 studies in other places in the US that had many results. Uh, so I said that's potentially true. Um, and then the third one, that's, that's a hard one because, you know, my, my initial reflex is to say it's very unlikely that pre-hospital vase and presses work. But it might be that in a combat setting where you can get hemorrhage control with you know, four tourniquets and you then just propping the blood pressure up a little bit is valuable. Um, so that's a difficult one. Uh, it, would, it would be unusual, though, for there to be such a large group, 28,000 combat casualties with a, a study looking at pre-hospital vasopressors that seem to be unlikely to be significant amounts of vasopressor use. In sort of those cases, so I want to say the third one is is uh, the fault, the fake, and the other two are science. Thank you. Um, but I really would like to go with Claire. <laughs> <laughs> you can retrospectively go with Claire if she agrees with you. Uh, yeah, let's go to Jess next. Thanks. 
Um, so in regard to the first one, um, I would have similar questions about, I guess, the the way the service is provided. I feel like I have um, read something about some services that do tend to prioritise staying and treating patients for sort of longer periods of time than we're trained to do. And so this sort of seems like something kind of familiar to me that there are some services where they they wouldn't transport to the hospital quickly at all and there could potentially be consequences of that. It sort of sounds vaguely familiar. Um, but it does sound like it's quite a large number of patients and it does seem quite unlikely that there'd be a significant difference um, in terms of mortality with um, physician care. But that seems potential to me. I'm going to keep mulling it through. Um, number two, um, this is not my area of expertise really. Um, it's something that I've heard of. I know we provide it in some places in Australia and there is some evidence for pre-hospital CT scanning. So this is potentially true. I'd probably call that one science. The third one, um, I think that there's probably enough complex statistics here um, using regression and accounting for multiple variables that this could be true actually. As Carl said, I think if you give vasopressors in the right situation to certain patients where it's indicated, then it would be associated with survival. It doesn't mean that it should be given to all patients in this context, but I think with, in the right patients that other things have been accounted for, I think this is reasonable. I think in the balance of things, I'd probably go with number one being the, the fiction. Okay. But I may, I may change my mind once Claire gives her answer as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you didn't GWK anyway. Uh, thank you. I did do a GWK. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, I thought... Yeah, I thought Carl... Oh, no, hang on, we didn't. No, sorry, no, no, we disagreed. Yeah, yeah. I went so, with, with one. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. Um, oh, well. right, let's, go, uh, let's go Phil, Claire, Rob, please. Uh, okay, so number one, I'm going to say is uh, true. 14,000 trauma patients is an extraordinary number who are hypertensive, all treated by a physician. I think that the problem here was the experience of the physicians and the training potentially. So I think that's probably true. I'm going to say number two, I'm going to say number three is also True, these are young, healthy, fit guys who can take all sorts of mistreatment from us and they've survived well regardless. We're not treating little old ladies here. And I'm going to say number two is is garbage. Yeah. Okay, number two is a feature. So this is great. All three of you are different, which means one of you is going to have won this potentially. It also means that I have to decide who I'm going to <laughs> go with. Wow. Um, that said, there is also the Ruby connection. She has added her suggestion. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Um, I did just see that. So um, there is always the option of go with Ruby, who's not even here. Um, but I love that you're online, Rubes. Um, okay. So for me, I guess I'm looking at it from the same sort of mindset of looking at the science rather than anything else. Um, so if I'm going to start with the, the third one, um, 28,000 combat casualties, that to me is sounds like we're heading to somewhere where there's going to be both um, civilian and military combat combats. And I'm a little bit with Jess. The complexity here of how many patients they've seen, how much they've used vasopressors um, after this complex um complex statistics basically that they're playing with I'm assuming that that's going to be a retrospective study means that they can probably um, find the answer that they want which is they want to say that pre-hospital vasopressor use is okay they're hearing Carl and going aramine 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 uh -huh. <laughs> and, and so somebody's doing that a little bit like the thing of chocolate and red wine should be consumed every day for a happy and healthy heart so totally. I feel like this is I feel like this one is going to be true, even though Carl thinks it's false because it goes against everything he possibly believes. So <laughs> I think that's what I'm going to say. So I'm not going to, I'm going to say that's true. Um, 
I think the first one, we're going to Japan. There's a lot of patients there. Um, and I think that even though they're adjusting for baseline severity, uh, baseline characteristics, um, the physicians are likely to go to the sicker ones no matter what, um, who are probably going to have a higher mortality rate to start with. I think I'm going to say that that is probably going to be true um, in that I think physician, that, that is probably going to be the case. So I'm going to go with Phil. Um, and I think it will really help with Matt Miller and his involvement in the stroke CT scanner that they're going to have here. I just really, yeah, I think the idea of a stroke scanner to me um, annoys me. So I'm going to go yeah. over that one. <laughs> okay. Really? That's the, one you want, the one you want to be the fiction. I yeah, I know. I'm I a little totally bit with Carl. Yeah. I'm going with Carl on what I want to be wrong, and yeah. I'm going to go, that's the case. Yeah, so that's, that's I'm going to go with Phil. All right. Brilliant. Cool. Yeah, look, basically, I'm going with Phil as well. Um, on, on the on the notion, uh, similar to what Claire said there about uh, Matt Miller and his involvement with the CT scanning project for New South Wales Ambulance, he hates it and uh, the idea of it. And so I, I would have heard about this study if there was any plausibility um, whatsoever. But um, the other two, uh, yep, Japan... Bunch of doctors getting there, sicker patients, probably dicking around for a bit, bit longer than others. Um, seems to make sense. I think number three, equally, uh, you know, huge database. They pulled some numbers out of um, this big database that they want to uh, try and prove something. And it's probably still only a small number that have actually received some vasopressors. It's not that all 28,000 have. Um, so I think they've just tried to uh, pull some numbers out of there and the database. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go with Phil, and number two is bullshit. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rob, so number two is the bullshit. All right, so um, let's just see, uh, make sure I've got it down correct, who's chosen what for the fiction. So uh, it is just Jess who thinks number one is the fiction. Um, most, uh, the majority went with Phil, with um, with number two, including Natalie Mays is online. Yeah, Nat and Garth as well. <laughs> okay, I'll right. Go with Phil as a hashtag. Yeah, <laughs> GWP. All right, so we've got Nat, uh, Garth, Ruby, um, Phil, and Claire have gone with Phil. All right. Did so Ruby get up going with Phil? I thought she went with Oh, Claire. sorry, sorry, no, I got that wrong. Uh, yeah, no, Ruby. Oh, no, I've got two R's because R's for Rob. Yeah, okay. Ruby no, Ruby's Ruby GWK. Yeah, so leaving Ruby and Carl, who think that number three is the fiction. Is this too obvious to put one of those pointing ones for me? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's not too obvious. But I, I like what some of you have done. That, that when you when you're answering these science or fiction quiz questions, uh, uh, certainly on the Skeptics Guide, my tendency and some of the panel members is to is to go with what you wish for. Like there's something you really want to be true, so you say that's true. Um, yeah, Jeff. Um, one of the underlying difficulties is that any single one of them can completely be part of science. Because it's published in a peer-reviewed journal. Correct. Which, unfortunately, all of three of them could be true, all things that they Yeah, yeah, we might, we might come back to that. That's a great point. Yeah. I'm going to go with all of them are true. <laughs> okay. You're definitely wrong. All right, let's see if you're right. So as we've got, um, everyone's got a different view. I'll just go through them in order. Uh, in a study of over 14,000 trauma patients who were hypotensive at scene, those treated by a physician staff of permanence compared with regular EMS had significantly longer scene times and significantly higher mortality, even adjusting the baseline characteristics, including injury severity. And this one is science. So, um, yeah, for, it's big numbers, isn't it? And there's Japan for you. Lots of Japanese people. Um, and they have a lot of pre-hospital physician-based services, uh, helicopter and road-based. And this study excluded HEMS patients for some reason. So these weren't the heli docs that uh, Carl and Terry sit and watch on their favorite program. Uh, these are road ones. So whether that means they didn't qualify to work on the helicopter, they're a second class of HEMS, uh, a first doctor in Japan, who knows about the system? I have no idea. Um, but uh, they did have much longer scene times. Uh, these are medians here. Um, and essentially, 
the mortality, 28% versus 17%. So big difference in mortality. Um, so that's interesting. So overall, they did have a higher mortality rate. Um, there are some other subgroups, however, which were sort of predefined, which went in the other direction. So here they're looking at odds ratios of death. So if it's greater than one, with confidence intervals that are greater than one, then there's a great, statistically greater likelihood of death. Okay, these are overall numbers. But if you look at cardiac arrest on scene and extreme hypotension on scene, there was a significantly statistically greater likelihood of survival. Odds ratios less than one, certainly for this one, certainly for cardiac arrest. So if they went to a traumatic cardiac arrest and they made it to hospital, they were more likely to survive with the physician-based team. So uh, make what you want of that. Again, it's, a, it's you know, not a randomized controlled trial. They did try to correct for confounders with injury severity, but not with tasking. So there will be subtle reasons why a physician was sent that were not captured. All right, so physicians probably were getting sent to ones that were hairier, that wasn't packed up, picked up in that multivariate uh, regression. Um, so it's plausible that if you're hypotensive from trauma and you need hospital treatment, then having a physician uh, spend longer on scene is bad for you. But those patients that would otherwise be dead without physician level intubation, uh, interventions, like um, you know, the traumatic cardiac arrest, that they're more likely, to, more likely to survive. Also, interestingly, the median abbreviated injury severity score for head injury was zero in these. So there are very few head injured patients. And so the kind of patients we think we make the biggest difference on, you know, those who need pre RSI and neuroprotective ventilation, there are very few of those in this study. There are arguably more bleeding trauma patients who you'd think wouldn't benefit so much from pre-hospital uh, care if, if you're prolonging scene time. Yes, and there's the injury, injury severity score is only greater than 16 and 30 percent. That's tiny. Yeah. So yeah. they're not particularly injured patients. Yeah, even though they were hyper They'd all be false from high. Um, yeah. False from steady high in elderly people. Um, look, the other thing is, in Japan, very interestingly, their, their paramedics have a single medication they can administer, and that's adrenaline. No other medications. No analgesia. No, they're completely, EM, EMS is completely BLS. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at number two. Patients attended by ambulances capable of providing CT scanning and thrombolysis. They had significantly less disability at 90 days in a prospective American multi-center controlled trial of over 1,500 patients. Uh, this was published in the New England Journal, uh, middle of last year, um, where they compared these mobile strike unit, stroke units that had critical care nurses, uh, CT techs, and the physician that directed the care was a telehealth neurointerventionalist or neurologist who would read the CT scan and prescribe the TPA that a critical care nurse would then give. Um, it wasn't truly randomized. It was done on alternate weeks. So one week it would be normal EMS. The next week it would be the mobile stroke unit. And they sh their primary outcome was the modified ranking scale of zero or one. So zero is no disability and number one is minor, minor disability where you can live an independent life. So that's usually what the outcome, the outcome we're after. Um, and so the mobile stroke unit had a greater proportion of MRS 0 or 1 compared with regular EMS, meaning their primary outcome was positive and mobile stroke units were of benefit. And so this one is science. Oh, wow. yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> Uh, meaning, <laughs> meaning, in this huge military data set, uh, pre-hospital vasopressors uh, in, improving outcome was the fiction, and uh, this was published in pre-hospital emergency care, um, and it was associated with worse mortality in the combat wounded. And you're quite right. I can't remember who said it. I think it was Carl, um, or it might have been Phil. I'm not sure that you know, 28,000 receiving vasopressors, that seems unlikely. That's true. The data set was, was of 28,000 trauma patients. They looked at that whole data set, but only 108 got vasopressors. And they tried to match those 108 with roughly 108 non-vasopressor patients with as many similar characteristics as possible, uh, which is a, a kind of propensity matching. 
So when you're doing a retrospective database study, um, you've got a um, there's a statistical technique to correct for the factors that would select you to go in the vasopressor group um, to try and make it more like a kind of retrospective um, RCT. So clearly there are weaknesses with anything retrospective, and anything retrospective at the end of the day is hypothesis generating, not not it can't prove cause and effect. Uh, the vasopressors they use with a list along here. So uh, mesoraminol wasn't necessarily in there, which is of course why it didn't show a benefit because you know amine would have fixed everything. Um, and um, these are the baseline characteristics that because it was propensity matched, these these should all be similar between the groups if they could. Um, they make the comment that um, it's a huge database, but American military um, data capture and documentation is shit and unreliable. Um, and uh, they basically said take our results with a pinch of salt, but they are consistent with most of the other studies on pre-hospital vasopressors or vasopressors in trauma uh, for all these agents. The only papers where there's a signal for benefit is using vasopressin and a lot of those are in animal studies uh, but if you look at the sum total of literature on vasopressors in trauma uh, they tend to be associated not surprisingly with worse outcomes not better outcomes which is what we think so, so the german study sorry a german study called the vitreous trial which was conducted completed and never published now going on three years mm -hmm. Yeah, still waiting for, for that. So it's been lost to the, the literature, which is very bad, because if you study people, you're obliged ethically to release the information that you found. Um, but it's a bit weird. Yeah, I've asked many people, and I can get no clear answer from anyone. But thanks. Um, I appreciate winning. And yeah, yeah. Uh, I might yeah. pay for many of you people. I guess the same thing holds for any the, we trust the all theory of the Vidal basic and we're gonna have kind of spy, yeah, whatever out of way. Either way. Oh yeah. Can you move the three right in the screen so I can see what the photo actually is? Thank you lying next to the bottle. Um somebody else. Yeah, hang on a, in a sec. Um so just 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 to, just to wrap up, um I think Jeff's point was the main take home here. All right. The, the job of the panel wasn't really to see if this was true science or fiction. It was, was this a real publication or a made-up result? Because, with, you know, they weren't all retrospective, but most of them were, and you can potentially show any result from big database studies. Trauma data bank studies, particularly from the U.S., just seem to be fraught with this bias. No matter how much they try and correct, you take the answers with a pinch of salt. And the problem I find is that you know, they'll take one signal like ketamine is associated with more cardiac arrest and that becomes quoted in another paper and then it becomes dogma, like it's proven, like it's real. Um, so we've got to be on the lookout for that. But thank you very much to our panel for uh, providing their expert insight and taking part with such good humour. Appreciate that. And, we'll have and, and, and to the people at home, just final comment with some, from Matt Miller, which was... Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up for the mobile stroke unit. He's very happy. <laughs> and uh, the no, it's not me lying next to it. It's the paleontologist that led the excavation of this 10-meter ichthyosaur, which was found when they were doing a routine drainage of a reservoir in the UK. And they uncovered this one of the largest ichthyosaur fossils in the world just just uh, last year. Um, it's pretty cool. But you know, was it real or was it made up? Okay. Thanks, team. <laughs> It's good to capitate where that picture is. It's quite funny. Red wine and chocolate. And that concludes the end of the day. Thanks to Fraser for organising it all and Carl for yeah. Thank you. coordinating. Thank you. That was fun. I liked it. Thanks, Rubester. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I'll hold out the mic. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>